We all know there's a lot of data out there. The real issue is whether AI can be used to help leaders determine what actions to take. Artificial intelligence, sure, will make leaders a lot smarter if it can provide them with actionable information. Richard Potter, CEO of Peak, explains the definition of what he refers to as decision intelligence. Enjoy this episode. IT Visionaries is created by the team at mission.org and brought to you by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Build connected experiences, empower every employee, and deliver continuous innovation with the customer at the center of everything you do. Learn more at salesforce.com slash platform. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. Today, we have a special guest. He is the CEO of Peak, Richard Potter. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Albert. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. You're in a very interesting space. A lot of different people have different definitions of what AI is, and they explain it on all different use cases and purposes. But before we get too far into it, can you tell our audience what is Peak and what do you guys focus on? Of course, yeah. So Peak's a decision intelligence platform. Essentially, uh, we focus on allowing, I I guess, all businesses to put AI into their decision making and optimize the way they run their companies using artificial intelligence. Let's dive in right out the gate because you are the first company of our guests. You're the first person from Manchester and you're also the first company that's using this term decision intelligence that I have a record of. Decision intelligence, give us give us an explanation and maybe some use cases of what it is and how is it applicable? Yeah, great question. So I think, I mean, obviously I've just described Peak as an AI company there, right? Our view, my view, uh, Peak certainly is that the way in which we're going to harness AI to its maximum potential in the commercial setting, like how how a business is actually going to run on AI is by taking the predictive power and, uh, and harnessing everything that algorithms can give us to create models that predict and categorize huge data sets. And we put those predictions and categorizations to work in decisions. So it's no good just having that prediction. You have to actually put it to work for a purpose. And as businesses, our entire value, everything we create is the sum total of all of our decisions, right? So it makes sense that in the commercial setting, the commercial application of AI to essentially run our companies is what we would term decision intelligence. So if we think about use cases, they can span everything from how we engage with our customers, how we attract new customers, how we price our products, how we, how much inventory we hold, where we put those products, uh, but also how we fulfill the demand for our products and essentially how we run our entire value chain. I think that's the potential for, for, for decision intelligence in business. So give us an idea of some of the sectors you met that Peak is optimized for or that works really well with. I know that you're presenting at NRF, which is National Retail Federation or Foundation, I can't remember. It sounds like you're going to pre- present at their show. Is it a retail specific product? Is it work in multiple sectors? Give us an idea of what sectors decision intelligence works in. We see peak as decision intelligence as a very horizontal technology, right? I mean, that's the, I, think, I think that's true of machine learning and artificial intelligence too, right? For us, our platform uh, is essentially comprised of a few key components, right? It allows you to create a data or get your data ready for AI, yeah? With that AI ready data set, you can then create your own AI that fits your own business and then you can put it to work into different applications. So the Peak platform has a number of different applications on it. Typically, our customers are using those applications in a number of different sectors. So they're using that in retail, as you mentioned, Albert, using it in CPG, in manufacturing uh, and a whole host of others, but one of the common uh, the commonalities across uh, all of our customers and all of the applications that we run on the Peak platform is that our customers have a lot of data, high transactional frequency businesses. Typically, they typically have a physical product that becomes their value chain. Right? If you think about it, a lot of those businesses have a product that they're, they're essentially generating demand for. They're then managing that demand and fulfilling that demand with inventory and product and then they're and then they're running a supply chain so that that entire value chain can be optimized using ai uh, and in doing that uh, you're going to uplift your growth you're going to uplift your profit margins that's what we think the true sort of potential for this in businesses is now while we typically work in those uh, those sectors um, and, our, and our and our platform is used predominantly in those sectors that's pretty much by virtue of us this being a newish thing Right. We've been going for a few years uh, with the sort of pioneers and category leaders in the space. But we are seeing our platform now be used in all sorts of different places from financial services to healthcare to automotive to 
uh, agri-tech, we're getting pulled in all sorts of different directions because it's very horizontal. But what we've seen to date is that it's very, very efficient at optimizing the value chain of those sorts of companies that have physical products they need to sell and manage demand for. It's a, it's a perfect application. Yeah. And with everyone who's been watching the news over the last two, three years understands how challenging the environment has become to move products around, to get them into the hands of customers, how to order, so fulfill all those challenges that are happening at the same time. Additionally, this is a highly, highly competitive market, what you're in right now. There's a lot of companies that are playing in this space. We've had some on the show. They all come at it from different angles and approaches. What would you say is unique about your systems? Was Is it how you've engineered the solution? Or what would you like to say to say like, hey, this is what differentiates Peak from some of the other players that might be out there claiming that, hey, they have AI solutions for, you know, supply chain issues or tr- highly transactional data issues. Because, you know, this isn't something that obviously there's a lot of people chasing this and it's a it's a it's a problem worth solving. I'd love to hear how you guys think about your differentiator. So we've approached it from a unique perspective, which I think has led our product response to be very different to most companies, which kind of marks us out as unique. So something unique in our point of view is that we fundamentally believe at Pete that in order to create AI that amplifies our competitive advantage as a business. We have to have an AI that is built for us. It's our own, right? It can't be generic. It can't be shared. It can't, they, these can't be sort of generic applications that lots of companies use because that's not going to give us a competitive advantage. On top of that, all companies have different customers, different products, different value chains, different data sets, different everything, right? So generic pieces of intelligence just don't cut the mustard. So we believe that our customers need to create their own AI Um, But it's the creation of that AI that can be standardized, not the AI itself, right? If that makes sense. Now, if you play that forward, what that means is you're basically saying to every company that wants to get on this train, you've got to build your own AI. And I would say like 95% of businesses in the world can't build their own AI. So what we've set about doing is (laughs) is trying to build a platform that democratizes that capability, basically. And that's where our product response comes in. And the Peak platform is highly differentiated because what it does is, first of all, it puts everything you need in one place. So there's there's a whole suite of features on the Peak platform for data management, a whole suite of features built for creating that intelligence and an area where our business people, our business teams go to work and access that intelligence that you create. But on top of that, we've put it all in the cloud from day one. We are, um, we've been cloud first and the distribution model for our software combined with the essentially the full stack nature of its feature set added to the fact that it has loads of applications just ready to go it dramatically speeds up the rollout of any ai applications the uh, the embrace of those outputs and those predictions and those optimizations by business teams but also it means that with a handful of resources you can do so much more so you don't need to build your own platform you don't need to build huge in-house teams regular business people and teams can run this software and uh, regular it's like it teams data teams can harness the power of peak to create really special applications so so i think that's kind of what makes us unique but hey you know lots of people coming at it different ways yeah and give us an understanding when you were building the company building the solution with your teammates one of the things when we hear about when we work with different guests from different companies, they talk about a lot is time to value, right? And so if you're helping build an AI tool that literally helps other companies build their own AI, right? And it makes total sense. So for anyone listening and didn't catch that bar, Richard's example, you know, take, for example, someone who's in the food industry versus someone who might be in the furniture industry. Furniture, highly durable, lasts a long time, can sit on the shelf. Food obviously cannot do that. And it's, it's got to turn very quickly. So the forecasting demands of furniture are very different from food. Obviously, these two companies could not use the same AI. They would be one, only one could be happy. No, one, Someone's pissed. But if you're building a tool that helps other companies build their own AIs for their own industries, verticals, applications, custom, whatever, whatever it is. How do you ensure there's time to value? Because, you know, like by your definition, the way you describe it, like when I install it day one and we implement it, like I'm working with you, there must be some learning curve. How do you shorten that to as fast as possible? Because we all know enterprises don't have time to, you know, wait, a, like they don't want to wait a year. They don't, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to say, Hey Richard, you give me, give me one year. It's like, no, no one wants to say, no one wants to give you a year. They want to understand how fast will I see benefit. Yeah, I think I think you're right, um, especially as this technology goes mainstream, right? So in the early days, early adopters, they're happy to experiment. But right now, this is going mainstream, mainstream buyers, they want results. Now, I think luckily for us, 
well, the reason we're even called Peak is we're very outcome oriented. The platform is built for results. So uh, yeah, we've we've done a number of things over the years that have meant that that sort of time from data ingest to value is as short as possible. You know, on average, most of our customers are going live in 11 weeks, which is incredibly quick, um, particularly considering that the high impact nature of the applications they're running. If you compare that to most like CRM implementations, which take anywhere between six months and 18 months, it's incredibly short time to value. But what you've got to do, I think, in in going on this journey with companies and, and, and the way we try to work with our customers is help them pick off the quick wins. What are the things that is going to like get a very quick return on investment and prove a concept internally that's going to galvanize a new way of thinking? Because I think that's actually the biggest barrier here. Companies have to almost relearn how to run their business in the most optimized way because this technology allows them to think differently and to operate differently. That requires proof. It requires kind of winning the hearts and minds. The great thing for decision intelligence is that it empowers everyday business people to just be superhuman basically so once you've kind of shown them that path then they're on the train like they're going they've done one solution they want the next they want the next they want the next so i agree with you quick time to value is is important but i think that if you do that you then get a lot of momentum behind any rollout in this space and you're also hq'd or is your hq in manchester it is yeah yeah and are most of your customers in europe or more global in footprint yeah, our revenues, I mean, we're headquartered in Manchester in England, like you say, most of our revenues, 75% or so are, are in Europe. But we've been growing really quickly outside of the, the UK in the last year or so. So we have a significant presence in North America now. Uh, we just opened a new office in New York. Uh, we're also growing really quick in, in Asia. So we've got a fast growing sort of customer base in, in India. And we're actually kind of, you know, if you look at our global operations, we're distributed between predominantly the UK and India anyway. One of my co-founders is from India and we've always we've always done a lot of R&D in India and we decided to commercialize there in the last 18 months and that's going really really well as well so we're seeing big global demand here for what we're doing and um, and, and growing rapidly sort of east and west as you look at the globe from England anyway <laughs> yeah when I think about what you're doing in the supply specifically like you said anyone who's in this high transactional high products high transaction I think about all the analysts that currently work at these companies there's a lot of people constantly evaluating evaluating information to make the very decisions you're talking about, which is, so for example, like for, forecasting a manufacturing forecast, the whole goal of manufacturing for anyone listening who's not as familiar with this business is they want to make something that ships to a store that is pretty much sold the same day. If it was in the perfect world, it would sit on the st- shelf for zero days, right? Like that's the goal. They never want to overmake. They never want to undermake. They want to make just the right amount. Missing forecasts in this industry, as you know, retail tight margins is disastrous. It can be disastrous. Uh, you can read plenty of stories, anyone who wants to log on and see this. Currently, like we said, with so many people that try to solve this problem, give us an idea of how much more accurate can these people be with Peak? Because, you know, people are constantly doing analytical models. There's a lot of people figuring this stuff out, right? And we we know, like they miss, like the companies miss every now and then. Is there any type of numbers you can share that kind of give people an insight as to how effective AI can be? Like, for example, hey, it's with it's typically within 5% of forecast. Or uh, I know there's different, different num- I, no, I made that number up, but I'd love to hear what you, some of like maybe some of the anecdotal stories you've seen it from her from customers that kind of demonstrate how powerful AI can be and, you know, how long did it take to come to that conclusion versus how long would it take analysts on the perfect math model to come up with that conclusion to give us our audience a good sense of like how much faster this process is becoming. Okay. Yeah, sure. It's a great question. Actually, there's a few things to unpack there, right? The first is just to build on what you said, Albert, right? What, you, you, what you've sort of picked on right at the start of that question is the fact that we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty in business, right? And the way in which we deal with that uncertainty in business is essentially to put buffers around things. Do you know what I mean? So we're like, hold a buffer, hold a buffer stock of a product. Uh, we'll put a little bit too much in because we don't want to run out. Or if we're running markdown sales as, as retailers, like promotions, we often over discount or under discount. We never get it quite exactly right. The same is true of how we like, you know, how we run our ads, how we spend our marketing budgets, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. And what we do is I would say in the sort of that last end of the computing era, before we got into this AI era, is we use data to look backwards at how we performed to give us our best guess at what to do in the future. Now, machine learning is helping us do is take all that data and give us very like real-time, great estimates of what will happen. With that, 
we can then be way more certain. And if you're being more certain, you can you can eat away at those buffers. So you get to the state that you're talking about, right? Just the right amount of stock in the right place at the right time, priced perfectly. That's perfection, right? And we and that's what the technology is doing. It's trying to get people more towards that. Now, the way in which it's doing it though is not the same decision making process because a lot of those decisions can then be automated. So the way in which I might work with my technology as a marketeer or as a merchandiser or as a supply chain uh, manager won't be to make actively make every decision. It'll be to supervise a lot of the recommendations, accept or reject them, even automate them. And what that gives me is an ability to uh, make lots more decisions in a highly accurate way than if I was doing it manually. Now, people are really good at forecasting. They're really good at guessing. Like, I think I could price a product quite well or forecast demand for a product quite well, but I couldn't do that across a huge product portfolio in real time all the time. And it's that ability combined with the predictive power that's allowing us to be super optimized. Now, what I love about these applications is that is that it works, right? When when you start a rollout, you have a hypothesis and you say, look, we think there's, a, there's this inefficiency here. And you can quantify that. You can say to a retailer or to any other business, we've looked at the data and this there's, you're carrying this much stock. It's, it's consistently this much too high. Now, we could free that up. And if you free that cash up, you can pull that in to customer acquisition and growth, and it becomes like a snowball effect. So how can we free that cash up? So you start with the hypothesis and you try to test it. And as you work at that and and the results come through, it's incredibly exciting because what you're talking about there is loads and loads and loads of what what I would almost call micro decisions that are being optimized that on at scale make a huge impact. So uh, you asked for some examples. We've got some great ones that we're really proud of here. One of uh, one of our well, a lot of the results that we a lot of our customers keep these results confidential, uh, but we can talk about a few. Right, we've seen one of our one of our customers who runs an e-commerce website got a five percent total lift in revenue, optimizing how it's pro- like promoting its products and recommending products to its customers, which is just completely game-changing, lifting an entire company's revenue by 5%. One of our customers who's uh, one of the big, the top three global CPG brands managed to take 10% out of their logistics costs and distribution costs. And I, and I love ones like that because yeah, it's a huge number. And not only is that like, you know, contributing to better bottom line performance, but obviously there's a really strong sustainability impact in there too, you know, with reduced CO2 emissions. So that's what's really cool about it. You find companies that have a scale if you can if they can harness our platform and use our applications well these percentage point gains are absolutely incredible and really fun to watch like roll in so that that's kind of how we see it right you're talking about real time optimization of a of a value chain but you're actually talking about what I said at the top of the pod here which was like learning a different way to run a business you're looking forward you're using that prediction to make the optimization. You're not looking backwards. And that's the bit, that's the seismic shift because lots of people who are used to running businesses are used to those reports. They're used to looking backwards to look forwards. Now we can have a lot more certainty and look forwards. They have to relearn a lot of the, the old ways of working. That's pretty amazing. Just like you said, a 10% savings in logistics costs. For anyone who looks at a publicly traded company like Amazon, they'll list out how much it costs them to move the shipping fees. It's it's a line item in the typically in their cash flow statement. It's a monstrous number, typically always, for every company that moves products around. You know, one of the things I think about, and this is outside of Peak, but more so for like the industry of AI in general, is this concept that I love talking about different guests, hearing your perspectives on what is enough data to indicate a signal or a trend. So we've had some people on our show before that are in food data and AI, like they try to figure out like the menu and food trends. We've had people in shipping, we've had people in products, but I'd love to have, you know, hear your perspective. And I use the use case. This is the the talk I've done in the past. And so I, I did a talk about why data is sometimes not a great predictor of things that had never existed before. And so I used to do a talk on like Spanx, for example, Spanx hosiery. Before it was huge, it was nothing. It was a small little company, right? Doing a couple undergarment sales a year. Yet Haynes, the biggest maker of hosiery, didn't see that and say, oh, that's going to be a huge billion dollar market. They, you know, And then as the sales kept creeping up, it didn't create enough data for them to say, that's a big market. We should make that product too. In fact, they didn't think about making the shaping garments until Spanx was, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. By then it was a global brand. You know, they didn't move fast enough to open a market. We know these big CPGs, you have some of them on your website. How they make money 
mostly is creating whole new categories. They need <laughs> category products, new products, exciting products. So when it comes to things that are emerging, specifically emerging, where there is no historical data to indicate this is going to be good or this is going to be bad, do you see a place where AI can start recognizing that? Like, that's the next trend. This is the next opportunity. This is something that's worth paying attention to. Now, that's an interesting one. So trend spotting, I think, or that sort of market opportunity spotting is a, is a fascinating one. So I think there's two different ways in which companies explore that, right? Uh, we have a bit of a history of working in fast fashion. Some of our customers have a, a very rapid like test and learn model, right? You know, they might they make a lot of products, but not very many of them in unit quantity. They'll release those products and then use those quick signals to work out which ones are going to take off, right? That's a great way of doing it. You can use AI in those use cases because uh, what you can do is use AI to figure out if you're going to if you've got a hit quicker than if you don't, right? Because you can take lots of metadata about the product, like what kind of product it is, what color it is, what category it is, all these other things. And you can roll that in and you can say, hey, like if this is happening on the first day of sale on the site, then we're on something. And we've, we've seen a trend and we, can, and we can use algorithms to help optimize that. And, and if you do that, then you can just be onto the hit sooner. Now, I think that's true if you're talking about like iterative product launches. I think when you're talking about like brand new categories and and, and those sorts of things, this is at the other end of the spectrum really for for how can data support you in, in making those things. I mean, I just think there's something artistic about being able to like really synthesize and understand the whole market. You know, there's there are tastemakers, trendsetters, category creators out there who can see things that I'm not necessarily sure they're the best application of like uh, of AI. But I think that once you've once you've had that idea and, and once you're rolling something out, then absolutely, I think your algorithms can help you optimize your sort of rollout and plan for that. Now, yeah, I, that, and that's the way I would look at it. I think there's a continuum and I think there's uh, certain data sets and, and AI applications that are going to be used in periodic big strategic decisions like that and others that can just be used continuously all the time like product recommendations and you've got to kind of figure out where you know where you are on that continuum and what you're trying to use it for but yeah that's my take on that i think it depends is my answer <laughs> yeah well it's a good answer i mean and based on the way you described it i would say so i like to use i like to use examples that people hopefully can remember do you remember the snuggy the snuggy blanket with the sleeves no Okay, I don't know if it ever got big in, in, <laughs> in Europe, but in America, we just decided that we wanted a giant blanket with sleeves. This is a this is a product. It's it was a it was a company held it. It was a product that scaled from like you know no one wanted one to doing like a couple hundred million. So it was like a big blip, but then it fell really quick too. So I'm sure along the way they probably over manufactured, under manufactured something. So like I get what you're saying. It's like maybe we can't see how long that trend is based on your like based on your answer. Maybe we don't see how long that trend is, but maybe AI can help you optimize the production, the manufacturing, the shipping. And when the sales started to fall, it could tell you to pull back your orders and your production. And if you could get in a system where, like you were talking about, micro decisions are made so fast, so frequently, right? Instead of trying to order, like maybe you got in a process with your supplier, like, hey, I order fabric daily. I'm not going to order a month at a time anymore. I want to order every day. Every day I'm going to add add to my order. And then if the sales were rising, you could add. And if the sales were declining, of course, you could pull back. That would help someone optimize for sure how much profit they could generate even off of a burst. But I, I tend to agree too. I don't think there's any amount of data that can predict what people will want. It's just too yeah, hard. <laughs> I mean, if you take the extreme example, right, it takes sort of product visionaries like Steve Jobs to, to conceive a, and then commercialize something like an iPhone, right? And, and you're never going to have had, you know, like so those sort of vertical spikes of innovation and new product ideas i think the creatives are the best place for those sort of horizontal iterative kind of like derivative products yeah maybe i mean those uh, and i think actually that's one of the that's a thread that people are pulling out right this sort of global homogenization of culture driven by algorithms across big tech platforms like social media and stuff that's a thing right go around global cities and they can kind of look and feel the same because people's tastes are getting equalized a little bit because you know and uh, whether that's a good or a bad thing uh, you can kind of see that those sort of iterative like derivative ideas and tastes i think you know you, you're seeing ai play out in the real world there but you know yeah the, you know. and you were mentioning you know your co-founder is from india i worked with one of the largest soda i mean i'll just say i worked with coca-cola and we, it was fascinating because like you were saying as much as culture started to like blend they said tastes were still unique because they had they had like billion dollar skews in countries that would sell nothing in another country. And I was like, it's, it's unbelievable, right? Everyone, for example, I, I know this for a fact, they had Taylor Swift as their pitch person for a campaign. 
that was like universally loved, but it didn't work for every drink. Like they had to like change it for like e- each country had its own drink. So it is true that there's going to always, there's probably some, some things that are common. Like you just said, there's going to be some certain things, but I, I don't know if taste will always be, I don't think taste will ever, ever flatten out. I think that's going to always be varied. So, I mean, I think your hypothesis of letting companies build models for their model for <laughs> is, is probably the right way to go. I don't think anyone can really figure out one thing that's going to suit everybody. You know what I mean? And when you think about for yourself, one of the things, that we always ask because most of our audience is North American. Um, we kind of understand how tech develops here. You know, this we always in IT Visionaries want to know a little bit more about you and when there's an international company, kind of like the climate that it's built under. You know, people in the United States are very familiar with Silicon Valley and what goes on there. Give us an idea. What is the tech landscape where you are? Do you recruit principally? You mentioned you're starting to expand globally. Like when you were starting up though, were there what, like, what was the talent like? Did you just really rely on or happen to find great co-founders? Like, give us an idea of what the tech scene is like in Manchester uh, where you got started. Yeah, I think the tech scene in Manchester is a really exciting one, right? It, 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 it traditionally, well, I guess, I mean, Manchester in itself is a great and very unique culture. Uh, I'm not actually Mancunian myself, my wife is. But strong cultural identity, the birthplace of the first industrial revolution has played a key role in lots of other important shifts in technology. For example, Alan Turing lived and, and worked here after World War II, obviously the father of AI. You know, So we, we have that here in Manchester at, like at, in our heart. But uh, UK tech scene is is big. And, and we I guess we see ourselves less regionally and more sort of UK in this sense. You know, We have really strong biosciences, semiconductor, electrical backgrounds. There's big software and data companies here. Often those companies have, you know, sold to bigger US companies before they've really hit scale. Now, I think that that's the real challenge for the sort of UK tech ecosystem where we're sort of meaningful. And if we just concentrate on B2B companies here for a second, like those B2B software companies have often sold like early and not gone on to fulfill some of the big promise or, or, or hit the major heights that say maybe their US peers or even like continental European peers have, have achieved. But then specifically here in, uh, here in Manchester, there's a big sort of media tech scene, web tech scene, like the BBC headquarters here. There's a lot of like e-commerce and, and obviously actually, I don't know, this won't be obvious to people who don't know Manchester uh, outside of the UK, but it, it is a bit of a garment hub traditionally. So there's a lot of fashion retail here and so on and so forth, right? So I would say in terms of like, entrepreneurialism like general tech skills developers data science because of the strong universities and so on absolutely amazing where you start to hit barriers of the uk sort of tech ecosystem tends to be those very specialist roles where like coming out of silicon valley and other hubs in north america you've got a lot of product management expertise you know that sort of move to SaaS was really pioneered by salesforce and then embraced by the venture scene of uh, of silicon valley which has like led to spawning a hundreds and thousands of companies out out of there right so so there's a lot of like very niche domain specific like domain specific expertise that really kind of exists a lot more in the US and we sort of you know we're having to either grow our own talent learn and have mentors from overseas and or like just be flexible in where we uh, in where we hire and have distributed workforces for key specific roles so so that's kind of what we're doing and for us you know we I've worked hard to make sure we've got good sort of representation of international investors in peak who can open up our networks. Uh, I work with sort of mentoring groups in Silicon Valley, uh, other CEOs there, meet a lot of people, try to like open the sort of funnel for as many people, getting to know as many people as possible. And that and that sort of paid dividends. But you have to like really like fight the constraint of the UK ecosystem, I think, to do that, to build like a global B2B business like we're trying to do. Uh, whereas, you know, if you were like spun out of Y Combinator and sat in the valley and like, you'd, it would just be so much easier. You have like a few coffees and, go down the road and have a few chats, we'd see a lot of doors open, whereas we have to really be very proactive, I would say. Uh, the great thing is, you do, you do, you do. But I mean, like, the, I mean, the, the great thing is now we're seeing a lot of really exciting companies emerge here and significant ones too. Yeah, a, fr- a friend of mine, Matthew, runs a company called Matillion, who recently uh, a unicorn in the data tech space based in, in Manchester as well, uh, backed by some of the biggest VCs in the world out the valley. And that's really exciting. So, you know, we're not the only ones doing something like this in Manchester. And I think over, let's say over the course of the next five, 10, 15 years, I think we'll really see we'll have a strong domestic ecosystem. But right now, you know, we kind of have to, we have to grow out. 
that's the beauty of this show, right? We're seeing and finding out there's so many different little micro, uh, you know, hubs that people maybe don't really think about. It's really cool seeing or hearing how so many people, right? It starts with people. People are investing education, learning these skills, going into this industry, of course, contributing to companies like yourself, yours and solving these problems. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Richard, it was awesome having you on the show. But before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Richard, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work so our audience can get to know you a little better. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. I have to ask this question because my mother-in-law is Scottish and she would never stop talking to me about this. We see that you went to University of Edinburgh. Yeah. What was your reasoning for go th- going there? <laughs> uh, is this a lightning round or a long one? Uh, I finished high school in Scotland. Uh, my mum's Scottish and most of my family are. So I'm te- I am actually half Scottish, half English, British, I would describe myself as. And uh, yeah, and uh, I always wanted to go to university in Edinburgh, great city. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to do so, yeah. Listen, my as a person who's married into a Scottish family, so you were raised Scottish, all, all, I, all I know is this. When they start getting happy, tipping a few back, I don't understand a word they say. I don't understand a word they say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're laughing because you're like, I, you've experienced the same. <laughs> when I was little. <laughs> Uh, give us an idea of what you like to do outside of the world of work. Are you a big football fan? Are you a big outdoor guy? What do you like to do when it's, you're not working? Yeah, I mean, to relax. I love, I mean, I've, I've got two beautiful boys, uh, like hanging out with them. They take your mind off work uh, pretty quick. Uh, yeah. And outside of that, like very active, like playing sport, riding bikes, playing football, soccer, and uh, yeah, and other things. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, the usual stuff that a British man would do. when we were checking out your twitter your the company twitter handle it looks like you guys went and uh, had a fun experience custom crafting your own beers are you a big beer fan hard not to be uh being british (laughs) uh, (laughs) yeah we made our own uh, aipas uh we we called them uh we had a bit of fun with that actually but you know again kind of lucky uh one of my best friends uh, is a brewer up in scotland actually so he helped us with that he uh he brewed that up for us and uh we branded it so a little england scotland collaboration there again for you all right well now i gotta ask did you did you actually think it tasted good or were you just like eh, we didn't do a good job? I think it was good. Yeah, we had actually it was great. We had we had two batches. The first one was like on the sort of scale of I would call it like old man English ales, you know, uh, which personally I really like. But some of the younger folks here at Peak, you know, wanted it to be a bit fizzier and colder. We solved that with the second batch. So yeah, we did a great job. That, hey, listen, but you're, the story you just told is exactly what people tell. Uh, so if I, people ask me like, you know, tell me something surprising about visiting uh, the UK. I always say, well, they kind of serve beer at room temperature, which I was surprised, which by the way, I actually liked. They said, I was like, oh, that sounds gross. Like, yeah, I kind of liked it because I like darker beers. I think it tastes better. Uh, I was like, I think they got it right. Um, hey, I'm on your side. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime you're over, Albert, <laughs> we can go to the pub. Richard, it was awesome having you on the show. Thanks for sharing what happening in the Manchester tech scene. Thanks for kind of giving us an idea of what you're up to at peak. I agree with a lot of your use cases. I think building custom or making it easier for every company to build their own AI is a smart thing to do. I also agree with you. AI is probably a little far away from spotting trends, but if you're going to optimize the value chain up and down while the trend is happening, you still help a company win. Exactly. Thanks, Albert. Appreciate you having us on. 